Let's see. And now we have uh, a man who has been a consultant, hey, a, a uh, experienced worker on computers for a long, many, many years, and uh, Conrad Weiser will uh, tell us more about them. All right, welcome. Let's get your video back on the screen. We got off to a bad start here because I think somebody kicked the power. Okay, are you? You found your way back. Check your cables. Here it comes. Okay. Okay. Okay, can we kill the uh, light that's right on the screen? Well, we all, <coughs> we all use computer software, and uh, I've been in several meetings lately of, of, of professionals where we've, uh, <coughs> we've asked the question, is, is today's computer uh, computer software uh, a higher quality than uh, 30 years ago? The answer is resoundingly no, which is surprising because we've had a lot of advances in the technology of developing software. So why do we have this problem? Uh, what do we mean by uh, software quality and what can we do about it? So this is what I'd like to do, and time is a little short, so uh, I may skip over uh, part of uh, part two here, but uh, I'm going to start with uh, a little background just to set some definitions, and then we're going to actually look at some program code, and this is not a technical group, and so that may sound intimidating, but uh, you will understand uh, the point of what I'm going to show you, and so this is what we're going to try to do. But uh, if we don't get through it all, uh, we'll get through most of it. So what do we mean by the quality of application software? Well, there are two kinds of quality. The most visible are the external attributes that are apparent to users. If you're using a, a program and it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, uh, you're aware of that and that, that that's, uh, it that didn't work. Uh, or if it's very complicated and hard to use. But the other aspect of uh, quality are the internal attributes. That'll happen a few more times. <coughs> the internal attributes that uh, uh, define how the, so the software is organized and how it's written and how it can be maintained. Yeah. A little closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. Okay, I don't want to overdo it here. No. Can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> well, if there's an error, if you find an error, if you discover an error in your software, we call that a bug, and there are two main symptoms of a bug. One is you just get the wrong output. The wrong thing is displayed on your screen or printed on your report. Uh, a little more drastic is what we call a crash. This is when the program uh, terminates when it's not supposed to, or if it goes into what we call an infinite loop. That is, it just doesn't respond to uh, what you're doing and, and you can't uh, get its attention. <coughs> Surprisingly, a very large uh, software product such as a word processor or a spreadsheet processor is often released uh, with thousands of bugs and it's released knowingly with thousands of bugs. That is the vendor knew that there were unresolved uh, malfunctions in this software and nevertheless went ahead and uh, uh, released it to the market. Well, 
That sounds shocking. Why, why did that happen? Well, for one thing, software is very, very complicated, and the vendors respond to market pressures. Uh, we've got to get our product out before the competition gets its product, its similar product out, and we uh, we take chances of uh, reliability. Uh, <laughs> one of the reasons why uh, we have all these bugs is that some programmers. Uh, we call them developers now, are, are just incompetent. They, they just aren't uh, uh, high quality. We'll talk about that a little more later. And uh, another reason is that uh, some of the managers of programming are incompetent. And finally, uh, many users, like we have people in this room, are surprisingly tolerant of bugs. Well, that's just the way software is, and we have to put up with it. So we'll talk about that. <clears throat> so if the internal quality is poor, uh, that probably means that the uh, that, that there are going to be bugs that, uh, that are hard to find and that it's hard to modify the software. So an ap application with poor if an application is not maintainable, it's going to take too long and cost too much to to diagnose and repair suspected bugs, to implement new features, or to develop in the first place. So let's examine a little internal quality. And I'm going to show you <coughs> three examples of absolutely atrocious uh, computer program code. And uh, don't panic, I'll explain it. Uh, you'll understand this. And uh, these examples came from real software uh, developed by respected organizations that you have heard of, uh, published by well-known experts. They're not at all unusual, uh, they weren't contrived, and I'm not making this up. This, these are, are real things that we found in, in uh, major software products. <coughs> Here's example number one. This is uh, a little fragment of a program written in an old programming language, COBOL. And uh, if you look at this, you see that it's extremely repetitive. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, it's testing to see if the month is January, and if it is January, it says, ah, oh, there are 31 days, and uh, if it's February, there are 28 days, and so on. Well, I, was, I presented that example to a management group uh, and pointed out that that whole half a page of, of COBOL program code could be uh, uh, rendered by this one little statement here if we had a table of uh, representing the number of days in each month. And one of the managers objected and said, well, you're worried about elegance. We don't care about elegance. Did the first version, version work? Uh, that's, uh, that's all that counts. And so then we look at the rest of this thing, and I ask the question, how many test cases would uh, the testers of this code need to prepare in order to give us confidence that it works? Uh, well, the answer is probably uh, about 15. You need one for each month, and you need one for an illegal month, and so on. Uh, let me ask you, how many days does this thing say there are in August? 31. 31 days in August. That's not very good. Well, what, how did that happen? Well, I can imagine the programmer was, was uh, duplicating this code over and over at his uh, keyboard, and he forgot to change this 1, uh, uh, 8 to a 9, and that goes, that goes undetected for a long time. We may run a lot of test cases through this, and they all appear to work. This is a typical case. Well, that's an older example. Uh, here's a cliche that we often hear. Uh, this is a, a, uh, an ancient point of view. This is a 1960 point of view. Uh, there are lots of programs that work that are really atrocious, poor quality programs because they're almost impossible to understand and modify and extend. Uh, so here's our second atrocious example. 
This is in a programming language called C Sharp. This is a very modern programming language. It came out of Microsoft. Uh, it's meant for uh, uh, applications deployed over, uh, over the web. <coughs> now this looks like utter gibberish, and, and it is. Um, I will explain a couple things about it. You see these exclamation marks? They stand for the for negation. They mean not. And these double slashes mean or, and these double ampersands mean and. So uh, we could say that we could explain this to you by saying, well, that's what it means. I put all these nots and ands and ors in there, and then I ask you, uh, did you understand that now? Uh, no. Uh, it's it's still incomprehensible. Uh, I, I'm a highly experienced computer programmer. I didn't. I don't understand that. It's just. Uh, how did that come to be? Well, let's let's tidy it up. Uh, hey, let me do a two-step tidying up. Uh, step one is we'll tidy up the layout. Now it turns out that where we split the lines and where we put in blanks is, uh, is not significant in this programming language. So uh, this version at the bottom of the page uh, is exactly equivalent uh, to, as far as the computer is concerned with the version at the top of the page, but for human beings uh, it's a little bit more understandable. We can see, for example, that this, parent, this left parenthesis over here has a mate over here with this right parenthesis. Uh, it's still uh, incomprehensible, but it's, uh, it's a step in the right direction. And uh, here is the final cleanup, and we wonder, well, what happened to all those uh, knots? Well, we noticed that uh, here we had, uh, we had a knot here, uh, applying to the whole thing, and here we had another knot, so we had a double negative, which turns into a positive. There's something really wrong with this logic. Now, how did this come to be written? Well, this was written by a uh, contractor in another country for a major software developer in this country. And when I say major, I mean really major. Uh, uh, I can't say that. But, uh, Are you guys on the same check? Um, Are you on the same check? And there wasn't any specifier that, that described the problem to the programmer in this manner. So the, pro the programmer probably kept making incremental changes to make test cases work, kept making it worse and more complicated, and didn't realize that what he should have done was to simplify the whole thing here. Now, how, what skill do you need in order to do that? You need to understand symbolic logic, sometimes called Boolean algebra. Uh, how many programmers uh, understand symbolic logic and Boolean algebra? How many of them should understand it? All of them should understand it. Probably less than half of them actually do. And so we get things like what you saw before. Now, I will tell you that this code you see here is exactly logically equivalent to what we started out with. Uh, so we, we tidied it up. It's not important <coughs> what it does. What it does isn't, isn't important to our discussion. So I said I was going to show you, th thank you very much. I said I was going to show you three examples of atrocious code. Here's the third one. And we're, we're doing okay on time, I think. <coughs> Uh, a major trade journal called uh, Software Development uh, published an article about three years ago by a well-known, uh, very well-known expert who lives in the Chicago area, and I mentioned that some people in this room know him, but I won't name him. Uh, and uh, he was describing a new methodology for developing programs, and his, his example was going to be, we're going to write a little program to decompose an integer into its prime factors. That is, if we give 420 to this program, the program will tell us that 420 is divisible by 7, 5, 3, and twice by 2. So 
2 times 2 is 4, times 3 is 12, times 5 is 60, times 7 is 420. So it doesn't take a genius to write a program to do that. If we give it a number that has no prime factors, it will just return that number. And here is the amazing program. This is program is written in Java, which is becoming one of the most popular programming languages these days. Uh, and this is what he, uh, uh, his article <coughs> ended up with and it sort of gloated over because he said, well, we've done this uh, very uh, easily. Now, we're not going to do a little course in Java here. I'm not going to ask you to try to understand that. But I'm going to augment that with a little commentary. That's the blue stuff. And this commentary will tell you sort of what the, uh, the uh, purpose of each of these uh, statements is. Well, we see that uh, he's trying every possible factor up to uh, the number that we give it. And is this and is the, is this 420 or whatever number we give to this program. Uh, and he's trying every every possible number. This is this little statement down here says just increment it, add one to it, and try again. Now, if I uh, what's wrong with that? Well, does this program work? Yes, it works. But what any high school student would tell you. So once we get up, once we get up to trying the, the square root of n, we don't have to try anything any bigger than that because if nothing bigger than that is going to evenly divide n that we haven't already found. So uh, we're we're going much too far, and we're we don't need to test all those even numbers. We don't need to test uh, six and eight to see if they divide 420 because we've already determined that two divided it twice. Now, if we give this program a large prime number, and here's an example of one. This number, 4 trillion and 39, is not divisible by uh, any other integer. It's a prime number. How long will it take this program to, uh, this, the program to decide that this is a prime number? Uh, I have a little program that does this uh, exercise, but in, in view of the time, I'll save it for, for the end. But uh, if, if I feed that program for 4 trillion and 39, and I hit the enter key, it takes about a, a tenth of a second for it to respond, because it quits trying when it gets up to the square root of 4 trillion, which is about 2 million. That's still a big number, but this is a very fast computer. Uh, if we go all the way to 4 trillion, that's a million times that tenth of a second. What's a million times a tenth of a second? Well, it's 100,000 seconds. So if I started this running now, I could come back Monday, uh, and it would just be finishing and getting the answer. So I have a, a catastrophically uh, awful efficiency problem, even though the program does, in fact, uh, produce the right answer. Um, so that was a, a, a notorious example that was published as a good example. And uh, these were teeny examples. These were, these was a half, every one of these three examples was a half a page of, of program code. Uh, a typical application is 200 pages of program code or more. Uh, you can imagine uh, the, when I said software is very, very complicated, uh, it is not only complicated because it does complicated things, but it's complicated because it doesn't need to be, because some incompetent fool uh, uh, created it. And uh, so what can we do about it? Well, one of the distressing things is not only do we have programmers that don't know what they're doing, but we have abandoned some of the practice.
practices that were common 25 years ago, reviewing the code that people write, uh, we often, nobody looks at what a programmer produces between the programmer and no. the computer. The second problem is 21st century managers, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But uh, and, and then uh, I've got some few things to say about the way we educate our programmers. Um, it, is, it has been determined by a number of studies, and this has been going on for decades and it hasn't changed, that uh, if we measure the productivity of practicing professional programmers, there's about a 20 to 1 range in their uh, how much work they get done. And surprisingly, the people who get the job done fastest generally turn out the highest quality of work. But what does that mean? That one programmer may take two weeks to produce what another programmer uh, dashes off in an afternoon. And furthermore, when you look at the two programs they write, the one that was written in an afternoon is probably uh, of higher quality than the one that, was, uh, that took two weeks. Because if somebody's struggling that much, and, and the problem is that management doesn't have a way of monitoring this. You give up an assignment to a programmer, and you don't know how long it's supposed to take. And there are many managers that do not believe this 20 to 1 ratio. I, I hear them say, oh, a programmer is a programmer. Uh, this accounts for a lot of the offshore uh, uh, delegation. We send programs to uh, people in uh, I won't mention any specific country, but in, in, in countries where we can't supervise them, we can't interview them, we don't know them, uh, and in some cases they, their English is not that good. Uh, and uh, uh, we do that because we think, well, one programmer is, is pretty much interchangeable with another program. Not true at all. And even when management understands, they may still not be able to identify, well, who are the people at the 20 end of that, and who are the people at the, at the low end of it? Uh, and they need to know that in recruiting new staff, because you interview people, you look at samples of their work, which they rarely do. They rarely look at work samples in, in, in an interview. Uh, and, uh, and then the... the setting the salary range, and uh, uh, so this is a, a very serious problem, and it isn't any better than it used to be, but it's just bigger. Okay, we'll skip that. <coughs> and we'll talk about the management problem. We see more and more managers being judged the current quarter's performance, or uh, if not the current quarter, at least the current year. And by the time the organization feels the consequences of the really poor software quality that's been developed under that manager, that manager will be somewhere else. He'll have gotten promoted to, or he moved on within the company or will have left the company. This is a very common problem. Therefore, why should that manager care about quality? They just want to get the job done, get the, get the check off on their list of accomplishments that they got, that they delivered this thing, and uh, then uh, they wash their hands of it. We've got to have a way in organizations of transferring responsibility from one manager to another with appropriate review of what the new manager is going to be accountable for. Uh, by the way, uh, I know the custom here is to uh, uh, save all the questions for the end, and we will have a question session at the end, but if, there's, if something goes by that you think is kind of important or you don't understand, I'll uh, be glad to field occasional questions while we're talking. <clears throat> well,
Well, we have a problem with education, too. When, when I started in this business, most programmers learned on the job through apprenticeship to other programmers and through in-house in courses in large corporations like Motorola and, and, uh, or even smaller corporations. Uh, today, most of the younger programmers come out of academic programs. Uh, every university has a computer science department and a, and a business school, both of which turn out uh, practitioners here. And uh, those courses are taught by uh, people who were products themselves of the same system. Uh, the instructors who uh, teach your 20-year-olds in uh, at, at the university may or may not understand these issues of quality. The, the grading emphasis is on does your program get the right answer? Well, that's this old cliche, any program that works is better than any program that doesn't work. So they, and very often the instructor doesn't actually see the work, that's delegated to a teaching assistant who does the grading. The teaching assistant uh, has just taken this course a year before and his or her knowledge is also a little fuzzy. So we, uh, they take points off if you did something really terrible, but uh, uh, at the end, the, uh, the products coming out of many of these uh, schools are really atrocious. And uh, here's a, I've got uh, some references to my website and I'll make these presentation slides available to everybody. Now I, I talked about what accounted for the first two of those three atrocious examples. The third one, that uh, prime number one, uh, was put forth as a positive demonstration of a technique called test-first development, uh, test-driven development, where you write the test cases before you write the code, and then you write just enough code to make the, that one test case produce the expected result without affecting any of the previous one. Well, that's a, a hot trend right now, and the Abbreviation, this DT, it stands for do the simplest thing that could possibly work. Uh, that, that means that uh, the programmer is not, doesn't sit back and design, well, how do we want to go about uh, uh, computing prime factors, computing prime factors of a number, we just say, well, okay, we'll, we'll write a program, does it work for two, does it work for three, yes, does it work for four, no, we'll fix it so it does. Uh, then uh, we, we go on and we get up to uh, 20 and, the, and it says, okay, well, I think that's going to work now for everything. And that's how that program we saw uh, came about. Uh, I know that because the article in which it was attached said that that's how it came about and it showed some intermediate steps. So that's, uh, that, was the, that was part one. Part two... I think we're doing okay on time. Uh, what, what do we mean by a good programmer? Suppose we give the same assignment to two teams of programmers, and we tell them to uh, deliver the results, and they, they do. How do we judge which program is better? Well, we've got two kinds of criteria. We've got the objective criteria and some subjective criteria, and this corresponds more or less to what I started discussing with external quality versus internal quality. So uh, the, ex the easy to measure uh, uh, criteria are the obvious ones. Does it work? Does it get the right answer? And does it take until Monday to do it? Uh, and uh, uh, the harder to measure criteria uh, which are very, very important and uh, overlooked in an awful lot of computer science courses and an awful lot of organizations, are uh, uh, these. Maintainability, how easy is it to modify this program, to add new features to it? Uh, how easy is it to uh, rummage around in it to 
track down a suspected bug. We don't know if it's a bug or not. I would, uh, if, I, if I can't understand it, I can't fix the bug, can I? And uh, uh, some other things about user friendliness, but the maintainability, which has two aspects, modularity and readability, uh, which I will talk about, uh, is, uh, is, is central to this. And I say here, doesn't everyone know that? And the answer is, I wish they did, because this is terribly important. Uh, and I'll tell you one group of people that does not know this. This is called the Chicago Quality Assurance Association. <laughs> this is a um, professional group that meets once a month and has uh, uh, presentations, and some of them are quite interesting. But uh, they, th they think that all there is to quality are the, the, is the external side, the, uh, the objective side. Uh, and so all of their presentations are about uh, testing techniques, which are very important, but they uh, have no interest in discussing the internal quality of uh, software. The, the three examples I showed you and, and larger examples of that type. Okay. So what do we mean when we say that a good, a good program component, piece of a program, is, is good? We mean that it solves the right problem, its scope is, is appropriately general, and that it's easy to change, easy to understand, and not unnecessarily prone to bugs. <coughs> now these are the two principal families of uh, quality of internal quality measures. Modularity and readability or understandability. These are these have been important uh, since uh, 1958 or whenever you would have started to look at this in every programming language, Fortran, COBOL, uh, the ancient languages, or the more modern languages like C Sharp and Java. Uh, this has not changed at all. These are central to all programming paradigms and all programming languages. What do we mean by modular programming? And I know this would be boring to non-technical people here, so we'll go through this quite quickly. Now, almost everybody, if you ask them, well, do you, do you organize your programs in a modular fashion? They'll say, oh, of course we do. We've been doing that for years. But actually, when you dig into them, only a minority of them really are, and that's because we don't agree on exactly what modular means. And I'm going to tell you what I think it means by giving you three characteristics of a computer program that it should be met by every, every program that is delivered to be used. Uh, characteristic number one is that everything, every attribute of the program is known in a single place. Repetition is a major enemy of software quality. That first COBOL example I showed with it, if, then, and, and so on, that was an example of unnecessary repetition. And even if the programmer who wrote that uh, had just taken his first introductory COBOL course and, and had no experience, he should have said, hey, there must be a better way of doing this. You know, it's just, that's part of the aptitude of, of problem solving. We, we don't want to unnecessary repetition. Uh, <clears throat> you heard of the Y2K problem mm -hmm. uh, a, a decade ago. Uh, it had to do with the uh, repeated occurrence of an inappropriate representation of dates in a lot of programs. And it was completely unless there was a self-inflicted cost of several billion dollars on the econ world economy. Some organizations, by the way, avoided that cost, and uh, uh, it's too late now, but we, we, we told them what to do. The second criterion of modularity is that each identifiable piece of the program performs one well-defined function at a single level of detail. 
we say that that module has a high, high cohesion. So if you pick up a, 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 a somebody's program and it's a payroll program and it, and it says this subroutine uh, computes the deductions and prints the paycheck, uh, well, that's a, a sinful uh, program because it's doing two completely unrelated things. And if you want to change one of them, uh, you're going to mess. You may mess up. You risk of messing up the other one. So that's uh, high cohesion is the second characteristic, and the final characteristic is that these pieces of programs communicate with each other through well-defined interfaces. If you've heard of object-oriented programming, it helps. It, it, uh, you don't have to do object-oriented programming to have a good, uh, uh, we call this uh, coupling, low coupling. Uh, but it, uh, it's a way of making that easier. So, yeah, I already said that, so okay. Now, beginning programmers uh, often mix up the program that produces some result with some dialogue with the computer, with the user. Well, you know, please enter the number that you want factored into primes. Uh, that's not, that shouldn't be in the same part of the program as the program that, that we looked at. Uh, and and uh, what, now one of the discouraging things here is that if you, pick, if you go into Barnes & Noble and pick up a textbook on introductory programming in any programming language, the examples that the authors of the books present violate this criterion all over the place. Uh, some of them are really terrible. And then you have those books being adopted in courses that are, where the students' exercises are graded by teaching assistants who just had the course. And you can see that we're not going to get ourselves uh, up to higher quality. How big should A module be? Well, back in the in ancient days, people wrote uh, COBOL programs that were 5,000 statements long. Uh, and they were monolithic. Any statement in the program could refer to any other statement in the program. Just imagine the difficulty of debugging uh, that kind of code. Uh, so uh, nobody does. We'd like to say nobody does that anymore, uh, but they they do. They they come close sometimes. So uh, uh, programmers need to understand that when, the when their logic is getting too complicated to keep track of, they need to split this into two or three uh, separate modules. Well, we'll talk a little about reuse. It's been estimated that 80% of the program code that's written is redundant. That is, it's been written before, uh, somewhere in the world possibly here in this same company, possibly even uh, two offices down on this same project. Uh, there's a lot of unnecessary uh, code being written. Uh, think of Microsoft Office and think of the uh, certain functions that appear in uh, the word processor and also appear in the spreadsheet processor. Do you think they're done by the same uh, module? Uh, maybe, probably not. If we could reduce that to 50%, no, I, I, I know you can't eliminate it altogether, then software development and maintenance would be far less expensive, more predictable, and more reliable. If you're using a module, a, a, a subroutine that has been tested and used in several other applications, uh, you're probably not going to encounter bugs in it. If you write a new version of it yourself for this project, you probably will have bugs in it. So that's it. Okay. So I said uh, modularity and readability were the uh, two important criteria. Uh, we saw in that uh, C-sharp example, the one that uh, had the, the ors and the nots, that the, the program was simply not readable. There, there's uh, even the most experienced programmer couldn't make any uh, sense out of it. <clears throat> what makes a program readable? Well, here are some of the things, of course. Uh, 
clear presentation, good commentary. Uh, there's a, uh, a comments are quite important. There are actually f four kinds of comments, and the amazing thing is that some of these uh, new experts, like the gentleman who gave us that prime number factoring program, are now saying, well, you shouldn't need to put any comments in your program because your, your code itself should be so transparently clear that uh, anybody who, who knows the programming language will instantly understand uh, what it's supposed to do. That is not, uh, that is sometimes possible, it is often not possible. So we, uh, it is important to add commentary like that blue commentary I put into that. Uh, and if I uh, pick up a uh, a printout, we call it a source code listing, a printout of the uh, Java code for a an application for an application, and I open to a page, and there's a a function, a subroutine, a module there. Uh, I would expect to see immediately what is this, what does it do, uh, what's it for, and how do I invoke it. And I will spend uh, four or five minutes uh, looking at it to get that information, and if it isn't obvious, uh, that module flunks. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, many actually do. Uh, there are uh, Current trends, set with, one of which is called agile programming, which is a you know, setting aside of a lot of discipline. And uh, uh, people actually boast about uh, that this program didn't need any commentary because it was so clear. And uh, uh, I, I hate to tell you the consequences of that. Documentation is not a separate activity, it's something you do as part of programming. Uh, the introductory comments are best written before you start writing the program code. Uh, this helps, I do this, it helps me clarify my thoughts so I know what I'm supposed to do. Uh, uh, the uh, detailed comments at the line by line level can be written later on. Now here are some examples of uh, good and bad commentary at a very low level. Now think of this is this is uh, trivial, but uh, uh, this becomes a thousand times worse at, at, at higher levels in the program. So here is a a piece of, uh, of uh, Java code that says add one to a variable called uh, position, and here's a comment next to it that says advance the position. Uh, that is a uh, a stupid comment that is a meaningless comment. It, it doesn't contribute any information at all. Why are we advancing the position and what are we advancing it to? So if we're scanning some text, uh, we might have a comment that says, well, skip over the comma. Uh, that's a clear comment. Uh, the program does the same thing. The Java compiler won't care what you wrote, but somebody reading this program trying to figure out how to change it or to track down a bug in it uh, cares quite a bit. Here's another example. Here's a, we're going to take weight and we're going to multiply it by 2.2 and the, the comment says multiply by conversion factor. Well, I can see that, and the, the people who are opposed to writing commentary at all will cite just that sort of example. Uh, they say, well, uh, this comment is utterly meaningless, so there's no point in having it there. Uh, it just tells what's obvious from the code. Well, what, what is the conversion factor? Why, why are we doing that? Well, here's the same thing with a comment that says we'll convert to pounds, which weight probably was in, in uh, uh, kilograms. And uh, uh, similarly on this last example. So we see uh, an awful lot of stupid comments, and then we see a uh, reaction against them, which says you, don't, you shouldn't have any comments at all. Uh -oh. And then we have problems with, with the formatting of the code. I've been to a number of uh, uh, presentations, including one last Saturday, 
at which somebody will show a program, a piece of, of, of computer program on the screen, and it is so long that they have to do a horizontal scroll so you can see the right hand end of it, uh, by which time you've forgotten what the left hand end of it was. Uh, and that's just utterly unnecessary. None of our pro of, uh, modern programming languages require that kind of uh, uh, crazy formatting, you know, as if you had a page that was, was uh, 400 characters wide. And yet people are writing that kind of program. And blank lines are nice. And, and here's the crazy old cliche. Well, we finished this. We finished programming. Now we got to go back and document that this is uh, this is wrong because documentation is a, a part of programming, not a separate phrase. And uh, I'll show those same examples again uh, and show how. <coughs> And just if we chose better uh, names for our data items, we might be able to, to satisfy those people and say we don't need any comments at all. So here we had a thing where we were putting something in a variable called T0, <coughs> and the comment says set the starting temperature. Uh, we could, instead of calling that T0, we could simply call it start temperature, and then we don't need any comment. Uh, so that, and here we have the same, here was our example of the convert to pounds. Uh, we should have a separate uh, data item called weight in pounds and, and a factor called kilograms to pounds instead of the constant to 2.2, and that's very clear. So <coughs> today's professional programmer is aware of lots of enlightened techniques that were uh, barely known 25 years ago. We've come a long way. We use better tools. We have more powerful programming languages, or some of them are anyway. Uh, yet the code they write is typically less readable than the typical program from 1972. Well, that's surprising. But what accounts for that? Well, one thing is online development. Back in the old days, programmers would work on multiple problems at a time, and they would submit a batch test job to the giant computer in, in the next building, and while they were waiting for the results, they'd work on something else, and when the job came back, they would study the results several hours later. Today, we never do that. We work on one task until we think it's done. You, you sit there and you hammer away at it. Uh, and sometimes you get a mental block and you need a little break from this one program. But it's, a, it's just a habit these days that we, we, we just will not leave the, the keyboard and the screen until we've got this program uh, or this program module working. Okay, what can we do about all of this? Well, we, we noted that the performance ratios are 20 to 1. Are the salary ranges 20 to 1? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> if the performance ranges are 20 to 1 and salary ranges are at worst to 3 to 1, well, why would we settle for uh, poor performers? Why not get people at the, at the top end? Well, when we're recruiting a candidate, we, must, we should always examine samples of their work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll tell you, well, I can't show you any of that. It's, it's, con it's corporate confidential or it's government classified. Nonsense. They've done something in their life that isn't government classified that they can show you that they're proud of. If they're not proud of anything that they can show you, uh, they're not likely to make a, a very positive contribution to your organization. The other problem we have in recruiting, if you read the recruiting ads in the newspaper or online, 
you'll see that a lot of them are asking for a programmer or developer who has had uh, three years experience in uh, Java version 5.2. Uh, They don't ask how good a programmer you are, they ask how, long, how much experience you've had with this tool. And some of them have, a, the, I've seen some of these ads with long, long lists of things that you're supposed to have mastered and people can, can uh, say that they've done some of that. But uh, <clears throat> a superb programmer let us say that we have one of those at the 20 range, the 20 to 1 range. And we, we've got a, a superstar uh, candidate being interviewed, and uh, she doesn't uh, know the programming language that's being used in the project that uh, we want to assign her to. Do we send her away? Uh, how long does it take a super programmer to learn a new programming language? Not long. To say that it's... Uh, uh, that uh, uh, we want to hire a, a Java programmer is like saying that uh, the taxi company wants to hire a Chevrolet driver. And by all means, the one thing we should never measure is lines of code. Uh, you, will, you will hear a lot of people say, well, our programmers turn out on the average uh, uh, 30 lines of code a day, and that's that's good. Well, think of that first COBOL example I showed you with the, uh, with the you know, if, if it's January, then it's 31 days. Uh, that's a lot of lines of code. We should reward our programmers for not writing uh, unnecessary, redundant code. Uh, so this is, that's a terrible measure of, of both the program quality and the quality of your people. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll zip through this. Uh, <coughs> if you have a, uh, if you work in an organization where there's a programming group, that organization should have what we call a central module library, a component library. Every uh, remember we said that 80% of the code that's written, program code that's written, is redundant. Uh, how can we get that down to 50%? We get it down by capturing it and putting it in some kind of an indexed repository that people can draw from when they want to develop a new application. That is a huge contributor to uh, lowering the cost of software development and a huge contributor to uh, increasing the reliability of the software we develop. And organizations that don't uh, uh, support such a library uh, are not going to turn out very, very good uh, software. I uh, talked to a uh, president of a, of a software development firm in Oak Brook one time. He rejected this completely. He said, well, our clients pay us to develop software, not to find it. So he was perfectly, he wanted to build them for the, his clients for the billable hours of developing software that perhaps didn't need to be developed in the first place. That's quite common. <coughs> A very respected expert, Gerald Weinberg, coined the term egoless programming uh, several decades ago. And what, uh, what he was referring to was the trend of that programming is a private activity. Programmers write their programs, they submit them to the computer, eventually they get them to work, and uh, those programs get put into major applications that are delivered to users, and uh, uh, nobody looked at what they did. Uh, he said well, programmers should be proud to show their uh, their work, and they should be receptive to hearing suggestions for improving it. You go in a conference room and say, let me show you the idea I had for uh, 
computing prime numbers and you show this thing and somebody says, well, did you think about skipping the even numbers after two? And you say, well, that's a good idea. So we don't, we don't regard this as an attack upon our, our competence if somebody suggests a way of improving our work. Uh, it's part of the function. So good programming, uh, good programmers uh, welcome uh, review, participation, and uh, suggestions. So today's enlightened approach, that doesn't mean today's universally practiced approach, it just says today's enlightened approach emphasizes that we write code for an audience. We subject our work to peer review and we file the end products in a way, in some place where uh, anyone can look at it. Uh, a, a secure professional welcomes that and, and likes to show off the work. And if, you, if you're hiring a, a, an applicant, the applicant should come in with a portfolio of things he's eager to show you. You shouldn't have to beg for that. <coughs> so that's the uh, uh, prepared part of this. I've got a couple of references here and I will make these presentation slides available. Uh, I've got two uh, little epilogues here, one of which is very quick. This was not a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and several people have said, well, you know, we're going to uh, hook up to, you know, to the projector here so we can show you PowerPoint. PowerPoint is the name of a Microsoft product for showing computer-based presentation slides. Is it the only such product? No. Certainly not. Uh, here are at least two others, including the one I'm using right now. Uh, <coughs> uh, but there's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, why do so many people use PowerPoint that it has become almost a generic term? Why did PowerPoint become the dominant product and a generic name for presentation slides? I'll give you two possible reasons and you can pick the one you like. Because it was far superior to any of the others. That's alternative A. The other alternative is because Microsoft made deals with vendors of computers, so when you bought a computer, it was already installed on your computer. And uh, uh, so, um, but what happens there is that it eventually does become superior to the others. Because the other vendors, seeing this happening, they, they stop uh, improving their products. You know, why bother when we've only got 6% uh, of the market? And uh, uh, that's true of not only presentation programs, but also uh, word processors and spreadsheet programs and uh, anything else. So we are uh, somewhat uh, uh, constrained by the uh, the monopoly situation with Microsoft. Now I'm going to show you, unless you, unless we're, uh, if, if you want to cut me off, I can, I can stop now, but uh, <clears throat> I said that I had this prime number program here, and so I'm going to actually run it, and you can see it's called, it's a Java program, which is not the most efficient. So we'll give it 420. Everybody see that? Yes. Sure. Now what does it do? Well, it's thinking for a second. And there's the answer. Let's give it a, uh, another, well, let's give it another number. And you see it, it responds almost instantly. Now I'm going to give it a prime number, a number that has no divisors. And it's just going to tell me sort of mindlessly that, uh, that that's a prime number. Now, I'm going to give it that huge number that we gave it before, the four trillion. All right, there's four, that's four thousand, that's four million, that's four billion, that's four trillion. Now, I'll back up to and put that 39 in. Uh, if I counted the zeros right, this is a prime number. Whoa, 
took about a tenth of a second. Now this is the thing that would take until Monday using the uh, algorithm that was printed in Software Development Magazine as, as a good example. Uh, because uh, this tried, uh, what's the square root of four trillion? Well, it's about uh, two, two billion. Uh, so what, uh, uh, it's going to try, and it's not going to try the even numbers, it's going to try about a million possible divisors, and this is a very fast computer, so it's going to take it uh, a fraction of a second to try a million possible divisors. But four trillion is a million times bigger than than uh, a million, so we're going to have, uh, it would take uh, 100,000 seconds or, or a day and a half. Any comments or questions uh, uh, that, uh, so far? I mean, that's the, that's the canned part, and I'll be glad to talk about anything you want. If you want to turn the lights on, it's okay. Soldier has okay. the first lucky question. Move, move, over, Brown. Okay. move out of the video, away, Brown. So, all right. What do you think of open source software like Linux, particularly the flavors of Ubuntu Linux, perhaps, or what, or some of the other presentations that might uh, do in it? Um, I've heard that they use things like a patch library and, and other items like this. What is your opinion of open source versus proprietary software? Well, I think it's wonderful, and I think it, uh, that the, it has been shown that, it, uh, that the, in terms of reliability, uh, it is uh, comparable to proprietary products. Uh, in terms of maintainability, uh, you can go in and, and change it. You can see the source code. Now, if you ask Microsoft to show you the program code that makes uh, Excel run, uh, they'll pat you on the head and send you away. This is not true. <laughs> they, they don't want you to, to mess with that. Uh, if you, uh, uh, so you have the smartest programmers in the world. Remember this 20 to 1 ratio. If you have uh, people, uh, they may be in Bangladesh, or they may be in Sweden, or they may be here in Chicago. If you have people that, uh, the, the top people, uh, uh, they're going to find some way of improving uh, something that's, uh, uh, that has a bug in it, something that runs too slow, something that uh, needs to be extended to take, to generalize it to other capabilities. So this will, uh, and this happens uh, in, a, in a sort of unplanned way. Now you, you can't sue them if you didn't like the result of it. I guess you can sue Microsoft for certain kinds of things, although if you read the contract. As, as, a, cor yeah. as a corollary, yeah. where is a good place to learn about how the various programs operate? Like, I know PL1, I know COBOL, I know BASIC, some of the older programming languages. I knew the file directory from DOS, but I put it aside for about maybe 10 years and all of a sudden something called Windows 95 came out. How do I mesh the world of programming that I know with the understanding of today's web technology? Is there like a site or a course or something that I can take to kind of bring that mesh of understanding in a well, programming it's, way? it's incremental. Uh, you can still write the same kind of programs that you wrote 30 years ago uh, to the, uh, the, the program I just ran, that uh, prime number mm -hmm. program, I invoked that from the command line. Now that's just what I would have done in uh, the 1964 operating system uh, OS 360. Uh, I would have done exactly the same thing. Uh, on the other hand, if I want to deploy an application over the, uh, the web mm -hmm. and uh, uh, have users all over the world uh, and, and, and you know, multitasking and so on, uh, then I've got more learning to do. But I would say that you, you, what worked 30 years ago still works. And uh, you, you, can, uh, I mean, you can take a course, you can read a book, or you can just experiment. Or you can hire a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, would you remind us of your name? Judy. Judy. 
Yes. yes. I'm interested in learning some basic programming. I'm currently in training to be a computer technician on Windows 7. Huh. And, oh boy, when some things go wrong, I can't solve it. I want to understand why I can't solve it. I don't know the logic behind the program. It's do, hard because go and learn this stuff? If, you were, if you were in training to do this as a Microsoft employee, you would be in, a, in, a, in an area where you had access to all the, the source code that supports this, uh, that supports Windows 7. Uh, as, a tech, as a technician out in the world, you don't have that. You have to infer what's happening. And you have to, you know, uh, knowledge of programming is helpful, but not in a direct way. You're going to, you're going to, uh, you may have to say, well, one of the things, this doesn't seem to be working for this particular case. What can I think of that would have accounted for that? Well, we saw, for example, in that, in that awful COBOL mm -hmm. code that, that the, the month number for August and September were, 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 were the same. Uh, so if you, if you say, well, every time I enter September, it thinks it's August, uh, you pretty got to have a pretty good uh, handle on what, uh, what's probably wrong inside the program. But you can't get in there and change it if it's, if it's Microsoft's code. Then you, you write to Microsoft and you say, I know what's wrong, here's how you fix it. That's right, you can do that. And you can, <laughs> or the, the, the cowardly cop out is you tell the user, avoid August. Yeah, yeah. Bill Watts has a question. <laughs> uh, is there any market for better computer programs? And if not, why not? Well, of course there's a market for them, but there's not the demand that we would expect. Uh, <clears throat> Users have become more decentralized. When I started in this business, uh, there were big IBM user groups. We went to conventions twice a year, the share organization, the guide organization, and we passed resolutions calling upon IBM to make changes, to add features to their you know, software. And IBM, uh, seeing a a room full of 3,000 people who were their best customers, uh, IBM responded. And they often, and many of the uh, products of that day were strongly influenced by the user community. We don't have that today. Uh, the, the, the government is the biggest user of, say, Windows 7. Uh, some other giant corporations might be, but they don't get together in numbers and say, well, you know, well, we users who are responsible for 20% of your revenue uh, feel that you should fix this bug in, in Windows 7. Uh, a, a, an irate email from one person like, uh, like you uh, is It'll get their attention, but it's not going to get their allocation of resources. Yeah. Uh, what's the salary range for programmers? The salary range for programmers. Well, it, it's gone up with with inflation. Uh, <clears throat> I would say if you wanted a top-notch programmer, you're looking at a six-figure salary range. But. Uh, uh, well, there, are, the level, there are an awful lot of, of organizations where, you know, we're talking about 35,000. Uh, uh, you know, we're talking about an insurance company, say. With, uh, uh, but um, uh, the internationalization has complicated that because if, um, if I write a program for somebody and I charge them uh, $130 an hour for, for my work on it, and they can send that job to India and get somebody to work on it for uh, $20 an hour, uh, they're going to send that to India unless they believe that I am much more productive, that I'm going to get it done a lot faster in a lot fewer hours and turn in a better job. But that is a hard sell. There are an awful lot of people who say, hey, programmer's a programmer, and they don't believe that. Now, I've had people come back to me. This is a, a, 
a pale satisfaction. The Duke Company said, well, you know, we really should have gone with your estimate uh, two years ago, but now, of course, it's too late. So, so it's, but it's, uh, uh, it's an international problem, and uh, the developed countries are at a disadvantage. Yeah. Uh, Doug Benkley and then Karina. Yeah, do you have an opinion about these various browsers that uh, are out there? They, they all seem to have a huge amount of code because they take time to... Uh, well, that's another case of, of the competition. Uh, it started with uh, Internet Explorer, which is now uh, practically dead. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then Microsoft bundled... Uh, uh, started with Netscape. I'm sorry, that's what I meant, Netscape. Yes. And, and Microsoft bundled the uh, uh, Internet Explorer with the operating system, and uh, uh, then there was a, a, a competition between Netscape and Internet Explorer, uh, and to add new features that were not standard, and uh, uh, then others came along, Opera and Mozilla Firefox. Uh, they're all very similar today, uh, some of them have bugs in them. Uh, Google's Chrome is a new, one of the newest ones, and I tried to use it a couple weeks ago and it kept crashing. So, um, it, but that's good. That's good competition because they're trying to get each one's trying to get a, a superior version to the market. But sometimes they add features that nobody really needs, uh, and that just complicates uh, the maintenance. Yeah. Do you know what programming language they use? Are they um, proprietary uh, amongst the different companies? No, no, they're, they're use standard programming languages. Uh, I think there's an there's an awful lot of uh, of, uh, of Java and C sharp for uh, anything that's distributed over the internet, as the, as the, as the browser information is. Uh, the uh, earliest browsers were written in C, uh, which is. Uh, pretty obsolete now, and I don't think that you find much C code in the, in the code of browsers. But I don't know of any, I don't know of any vendor that has developed its own proprietary language before implementing its browser. I didn't feel that you talked enough about uh, waterfall versus agile and extreme programming. Um, I skipped over most of that. Yeah, well, but what is your opinion? Do you prefer that we go back to waterfall? Or well, first you... of all, I don't like to call it waterfall. Waterfall is, a, is a, uh, what we're talking about here. When you are developing a large, complex application, we go through a series of phases. And the early phases define the requirements, what business problem is this going to solve, and then the next phase is how we're going to design something to do that. And then we have the proof where we write the code and we, and we uh, do the final testing and delivery. Um, some people who didn't like that uh, approach uh, coined the term waterfall methodology. And they drew a, a diagram that showed us going from one phase to another as if we were going over a series of cascades in a waterfall. And they said, well, the problem with the waterfall methodology is that once you've passed a certain point, you can't go back. Not true. You, you go back, it costs you something, uh, but uh, this is, uh, so, so the, uh, uh, I am, uh, I think that for any, if the problem is small enough, all of them work. Uh, if it's a big problem, I think you need a disciplined, phased development. Now, there are aspects of what we call the agile approach that uh, can certainly be used, but I don't think I think that's a little beyond the scope of what we uh, wanted to talk about with this audience. And if you want me to come back and talk about yeah. agile versus space development. So you don't, you don't particularly um, advocate for any particular software development methodology or software development language? Well, I, I advocate a disciplined approach based on the uh, uh, the idea of, of a series of, of life cycle phases. And if you want to know more about what I uh, endorse, uh, take a look at my website. And you saw the, the address go by a couple of times, and I have some cards here, too. And, and we'll make that available to you. 
So I have a lot of very, no, it's not true that I have no opinion about it. I have very strong opinions about that, but I just don't think that it would interest this audience. Okay. Uh, Ernie? Yeah, uh, when I do a Google search, it will put, you know, 10 or 15 items up on the screen, and down below it says uh, 10 of uh, 2 million or something like that. Now, how, how is the Internet structured that it can go out and find 2 million occurrences of the term that I've looked for in 5 or 10 seconds? Well, it's how Google is structured rather than how the Internet is structured. Google okay. has, uh, is constantly uh, crawling the Internet, looking at stuff, and it has gigantic uh, uh, data centers with huge... Uh, mass storage with parallel access and uh, that, that's very very expensive okay. and if you described this uh, to me uh, 20 years ago I would have thought this is science fiction but they have done a, a magnificent job with it. Now uh, being told that, that you had two million hits is not particularly useful to you uh, but uh, then you you are encouraged to uh, narrow your, your search. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Conrad, what's this demographic you have that uh, this 20 to 1, that there are employees that can do yeah. something? They're not in the government. It's like private employees versus government employees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's he's the one of the twenty right now. Yeah. What are more productive? What are the where's the charities thing? This guy go for a little. He's just getting out. I'm just ordering my dinner. I'm sorry. Conrad, where did you come up with this demographic that there's one person who's productive and the other twenty are lazy and incompetent? <laughs> I didn't well, I mean, say you have any data to practice up. Yes, I may, and, and the, the slide mentioned one of them is an organization called SIG CPR, stands for the Special Interest Group for Computer Personnel Research. It's a, uh, a special interest group within the uh, ACM, which is the largest uh, uh, computer. You ever heard of the Department of Labor? Uh, How about the Department of Labor? Well, they're Stop they're, giving me acronyms. Well, I'm giving you that they, they, that they have done study after study. Uh, um, and and they established that there's only one person out of 20 that's productive? No, well, that's not. Where's this study? study. Not, it didn't say one person oh. out of 20. It said that the most productive people are 20 times more productive than the least productive people with the same job title. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you have a range of per, a person does one task, or does 20 tasks, well, there are within the same corporation people who do one. There's a factor of 20 within the same unit? In, in, if you are given, if you give a programmer a well-defined specification, I've walked away from the microphone, but I think yes. it's a well-defined specification for something you want them to develop. Uh, uh, it is true that some programmers will take a couple of weeks to do it to get it done, and some will get it done in an afternoon. Do you have any like data, do you have any data called quantitative assessment of performance to substantiate this I don't have it, but I can find it. Okay. Please furnish it. Yeah. I'd love it. to see this. Okay. <laughs> and dealing in the 25 <laughs> years of oh, right. right. I see it every day. Nonsense like right. this. You won't find it. Okay, we've got, we've got some support on this. I see it every single okay. day. No, it's you don't see it. Yeah, I do. Subjective <laughs> gibberish. John's just kidding you. I have to ask you another Well, I said that some people say a program I, a program. I said, no. Okay, I have, I have to. All right. All right. From, from the movie, Office Space, do you put cover sheets in your TPS reports? I'm talking about widgets. I didn't see that movie. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to see it. Uh, You've got to list. see it. I'll put it on my list. How are we doing? <laughs> Tell me the same thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm supposed to go back here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to read on those some other questions. Hi. Um, <laughs>
I kind of wanted to talk about the career of a computer programmer. Did you find that if you became a really good computer programmer, there was nowhere else to go in an organization, or you either had to become management, or? Well, there are a number of job uh, job functions, and the other the other related one is the is the systems analyst. The systems analyst is the person who defines the who works with the users to define the specifications of what programs should be developed. And back in the 60s, a terrible trend started that organizations decided that they would take their best programmers, you're such a good programmer, we're going to promote you to be a systems analyst. So they lost a good programmer and gained a bad systems analyst. <laughs> and uh, there, there are people who can do both jobs, but uh, uh, that is not a career path that is embraced by uh, enlightened people. In many organizations, particularly in software development organizations like Microsoft, there are, are strata of, uh, of, uh, pr of programmers or, that, uh, that go quite high. I mean, it, uh, in IBM back in 1965, there were senior programmers making $90,000, $100,000. Uh, because they were that good. Uh, so, and, and then we get into uh, research areas like artificial intelligence and, and things where we're, we're actually researching new techniques. And uh, so I think there are lots of career paths. Uh, one, of the, one of the distressing trends recently is the uh, diminishing uh, number of women in computing. When I started in this business, about half the programmers were women. Uh, not the managers, but the programmers. Uh, today, it's much, uh, uh, it's much smaller because many women don't see the career path and they don't like the pressure to work those 60-hour weeks that we're, we're seeing in many organizations where they overcommit. And therefore, uh, uh, I, I just at a meeting a couple of weeks ago, you know, what can we do to get more more women interested in this career path uh, as they used to be, and um, uh, so I hope that works out. So, what is the percentage now of women? I don't know. Why would I? Why would? I, why would I care if I'm a, if I'm a uh, business person? Why would I care uh, what the demographics were of the programming community? Why? Why should I care if there's uh, not enough uh, Polish or? Hispanics or women or blacks or handicaps or veterans, why should that make a, uh, a bit of difference uh, in the quality of software? If it doesn't make a difference to you as a businessman, it makes a difference to the profession, I think, as a, as a whole, and, I, and to society as a whole. So I think that when I, I went to a meeting a couple of weeks ago on this topic, and uh, there weren't a lot of, of owners of businesses there, but there were a lot of people in, in mid-level management roles and in education roles. How can we get more, uh, more women uh, back into the field? So I'm not going to tell you that you need to balance your uh, programming staff in order to turn on better <coughs> software. I'm going to say that there are an awful lot of talented women out there that would be at that 20 end of the uh, productivity range. They may not be as enthusiastic about working 60 hour weeks because you overcommitted something. Uh, Judy has a question. How do we deal with the issue regarding? Give her, give her, use the mic. Programming doesn't necessarily require a lot of math, but he's talking about Boolean algebra, which a lot of people do not learn in high school and are not required to learn in college. What? How can you do programming without that? Algorithms. You can't do good programming without it, and I can teach it to you in a week. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Sprint class. I'd be willing to do it. No, I mean, it's, not, it's easy. It's easy. So, uh, sim uh, symbolic logic. Yeah. Huh. I had a question. Uh, Microsoft is pushing a new operating system. Do you think uh, some of what they're doing is uh, so they can uh, uh, force everyone to have this Backdoor situation where the government can get it, your uh, information to Big Brother. I don't. Uh, I don't know that that's what they're doing. I think what they're doing is trying to get people who have installed computers that work to uh, spend more money. And uh, they, they've always done that. but yeah. it's a new thing. This. I don't. Uh, I, that that. Uh, I, my mind is open on that, but it, it sounds a little paranoid. <laughs> 
so I'm walking He's around and driving the cameraman crazy. Here. That's all right. He's fine. <laughs> okay. That's you ran the Java program from a command server. Yeah. Um, are you against using integrated development environments like NetBeans, or is that just a? No, they're fine, and there are lots of them. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> but uh, I, I, when I teach programming, I try to, to introduce it at the lower level, and then we 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 move up to the higher level tools later. And and it was just easier for me to do that here uh, without going through a. a, a Big interface program. Like Charles, could you define integrated environments? Term well, this is oh, a. Wait, uh, wait, wait. Uh, you know. <laughs> okay. Charlie, what's next? Charlie, all right. Oh, I just had a question here about your assignment of work, John Rex. I don't think that. But you said something about the person should be given a lot of multi tasks to do instead of one test. So I guess if you ran this restaurant, you would save up orders and give the cook ten orders at once instead of one order. I don't understand how this affects his producing food. Well, I don't, I don't run the restaurant. I don't know anything about running a restaurant. I mean, the, the way the orders are given to him, yeah. whether he gets That's one, two, or more, more but if, if, doesn't if, affect if it's six people come food. in and order breakfast and he's got, uh, if he's making scrambled eggs for one of them, he doesn't wait until the scrambled eggs are done before he starts the waffles for the person that wanted the waffle. Right? I mean, there's, there's... <laughs> According to you, you could put my order down and do 19 others. Well, and, and they may very well do that, but they're certainly not going to do them one at a time from start to finish before they start the next one. Where did you arrive at this? Work assignment. Huh. You ever use punch cards, Charlie, and figure it out? This is searching. I can't do one task for a test. Everyone works for the government. Yeah. I think we're getting beyond the scope of this discussion. I would be delighted to have that discussion. But I think we're going to drive people. Many people are working for the government. You can't do two things at once. All right. No, my question. Oh, so it was a terminology question. Oh, integrated about development. Integrated what is an integrated development Oh, it's just, a, it's just a tool that lets you uh, seamlessly go back and forth mm -hmm. between the, the, the compiler and test executions and, and, and the editing of the source code for a program. It's, uh, it's not yeah, something, no, it's, it's not something you need, but it's no, something that's uh, just a nice uh, the facility. Yeah. Okay. And I see they've started bringing me my dinner here, but I'm happy to keep talking. All right. One, one, again. what's your favorite programming language, if you have one? I think we could save the question for uh, you want old languages, PL1. If you want new languages, uh, C sharp. Okay. That's good. But I don't think that's of general interest. All right, one more. Yeah. Cubs or Sox fan? <laughs> the Sox won 14 to 7. Today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> how about those Cubs? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, On the line of Tim, um, do you have any feeling about mainframe versus client server environment? Do, the 3270 um, MVS operating system, 3270 interface. Uh, I don't. I don't think uh, the efficiency or the quality of software development is is any different. In, in one environment than the other. I would have an opinion on the choice if I were trying to automate an organization and install computing equipment, but I don't, as far as software development, I, I, I use either one comfortably. So I, I know I don't have a preference there. 
Okay. For someone wanting to get into programming, what languages do you suggest they learn? Is C++ still a good language to learn? Uh, yes, and it's gotten even better recently. <laughs> They've added some new things to it. We just had a meeting of the C++ user groups last uh, Tuesday, and if I'd known you at that time, I'd have invited you. Um, but, uh, I'd be happy to come to meetings of the ACM. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, that, now, there is a lot of uh, demand for Java. Java is a rather peculiar language. It's got pluses and minuses, and uh, uh, but it's not a good, I don't think it's a good first language. No, I was thinking about Visual Basic, C++, and then Java. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's probably a good, All right. a good sequence. Charles? Yeah, Conrad, you, you've got this other claim in there that oh, dear. some oh, of this <laughs> is subjective. And you begin with mathematics, it's utilitarian task performing, and yet you maintain in several instances that it's subjective and cannot be scrutinized or, or have an assessment, which Turn it off. This is not the Art Institute of Chicago. <laughs> These are not artworks. Well, actually, These uh, are uh, things yeah. that you turn on to do something and turn off when you're done. It does it quickly or slowly or Any not problem that works is Where better. is the subjective part yeah. of this? The subjective part is... <clears throat> Given two programs that do the same thing <laughs> in, in the same amount of time, um, which one is better? The one, the one that's better is the one that's easier to understand, to make changes to, to diagnose problems with, and all of those things that you call subjective. Uh, they are not made easily measurable. They are, uh, but they're important. That's not subjective. That's change. Okay. It's not subjective at all. How about rebuttals? I, uh, I think that perhaps we should be moving to our rebuttal. Yeah. So. I really enjoyed the presentation. Let's give him one more rousing round of applause. One, one last question. What do you do for a living? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight, what do you do for the minutes? At least seven. Uh, I'll give you five minutes each to start. Okay. And we start. Uh, Mike was the first one he called. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> um, Let's I just got free. Want to move it back? Yeah, because that way we can get you get more of the. It, once we get the computer out of there and everything, much more centered, and we get the banner. Yeah. We'll not take it off your time. I just got back from a uh, medical trip to Norway. I was originally scheduled for a week there, and I was having such success with a, a very serious case of multiple sclerosis and benzene poisoning that they extended my stay there another two weeks. I went up there a month. Uh, as you know, 100 years ago, the Rockefellers started taking over the medical industry in the United States. They started producing drugs with the sludge from the refineries. And my observations in Norway confirmed my suspicions that they have poisoned the entire world with pharmaceuticals. I visited a uh, very progressive nursing home while I was there. My patient was 70 years old. He had uh, spent the better part of a year in the Gulf of Mexico with Red Adair putting out a fire in 1979 in one of the oil wells in, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. 
and was downwind of the smoke and fire for quite a period of time and developed benzene poisoning, which is a very, very serious case of leukemia. It's red blood cell depletion and oxygen deprivation. He was put in a wheelchair 10 years ago because of his inactivity. He was diagnosed with diabetes because his blood sugar went up. When you're not active, your blood sugar goes up. So he had symptomatic diabetes, was put on insulin. He had diabetic neuropathy uh, for a number of years. He had no feeling in his legs. He was diagnosed with hypertension. He was put on water pills. By the time I, I uh, was introduced to him about uh, two months ago, and we started him on a regimen of the pineapple smoothies that are on my website, within a couple days his mind started coming back. Then he got the feeling back in his legs. By the time I got there, he was moving his legs. And we had him off of his drugs. Uh, drug free the day after the day after I arrived in uh, Norway at his home and he's been progressing tremendously ever since uh, all his family that had visited him and seen him and seen his progress couldn't believe it that it was that dramatic I had him walking five days after I got there and um, his son and son-in-law built a rail in his garage uh, so he could continue his rehab there at will. And he's very excited about getting his life back again. This guy was a sea captain for many, many years in the North Sea, uh, around the uh, English Channel, and in the South Pacific, and in um, South America. Very talented sea captain. Um, it was dismaying to see all of the um, drugging that was going on in this nursing home. It's identical to what I've seen here in the United States. Uh, keeping these people quiet in these nursing homes uh, with these overdruggings. It takes about an hour to have a bingo game at the uh, nursing home. And I believe they play one game, and that's where they fill the entire card. And I just happened to peruse the cards as uh, the game was going on. And a lot of these people had no clue uh, how to spell bingo or participate in the game. It was very sad. Uh, and my patient realized that this were, was where he was going because this, they have a very, very progressive uh, way of handling their seniors. This, this is a communist country. And uh, what they do is um, allow people to come to these senior homes for a short periods of time. Like let's say your family is going out of town. You can have your senior come to this very nice uh, senior establishment and spend a day, two days a week, a month, two months there, get fed, uh, rehab, things like that. Somebody paying attention to them, changing their diapers, changing your urine bags, things like that. Okay. That part's real nice, but the only thing is, when you come home, they're brain dead. And that's kind of a sad uh, commentary for that. Well, we've got plenty of time tonight, so I'll probably be able to come up and talk to you about uh, total control, getting in total control of your health. Thank you. All right, nice. That's all right, just hold it. Where's the speaker? Can you turn the air conditioner off? Oh, okay. uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it wasn't all over my head. I didn't really get something out of it, but I wanted to take advantage of the subject of computers. I have some concerns about the general subject of computers, if you bear with me. Um, I have always been suspicious of computers and the Internet. <clears throat> These were developed by the U.S. military. 
in conjunction with their deliberate development <coughs> of more and more complex technology laden weapons. The country was told it needed to purchase the newest generation of um, tanks or airplanes or whatever, even though each new generation <coughs> was uh, far more expensive and harder to maintain and harder to operate with all the complex technology. A large part of our national debt, and we all know how enormous that is, is due to the cost of these, these many unnecessary weapons which only this country seems to think it has to develop. Of course, we spend as much as the rest of the world combined on our military. Uh, now, the concept of endless upgrades of gadgets continues in our economy overall, with constant new generations of whatever, causing more wasteful consumer spending and credit card debt. Worse yet is that no thought is given to the effect of these gadgets as they are developed and foisted on the public. There is concern, for example, that young people's concentration, ability, and knowledge bases <coughs> uh, are being damaged by their constant use of the internet. And drivers, for example, are being distracted using cell phones as they drive. So really, this is something that needs to be looked at, that we have one overboard in this direction. Thank you. Uh, technically, I've been a programmer uh, for quite a while, uh, <clears throat> since uh, 1982. Uh, I, I did COBOL and a few other uh, miscellaneous uh, languages, uh, and uh, uh, I got bumped up to be a systems programmer at one point, uh, but uh, basically since there was somebody else uh, that was much better, I just was I just latched onto his coattails. And <laughs> I'm one of those underachievers where I can, if I can just get by and it looks like I'm doing a good job, I'm fine with that. I don't, and I certainly am very happy to hear you sir, say, sir, that it's not the amount of code that you write. Because I certainly didn't write a whole lot of code. I, I, when I was a COBOL program in maintenance, so I just liked the idea that, well, I could figure out, even though if there wasn't any documentation on this thing, I would like to maybe do little displays of where the program was, what the program was doing, so I could see exactly what the data was at that point, and then I'd figure out, okay, then I'd just change this and that, and, and get it done really fast that way. But, um, um, I, and when I did do a program, I did try to document, and I did try to add comments, just with, like what you say, and I do that for my own purpose, because I forget what I did years ago, so I'm glad I, oh, I made a comment there, wow, that's what I was doing, gosh. Anyway, but um, since my memory's going as, as I get older, <laughs> but um, uh, I'm very happy that you say that 80% of the code is um, redundant. I have often thought of that that was the case, especially as my browser is mindlessly uh, wasting time or the operating system is doing something God knows what. It's just taking... <laughs> It's, it, it's just a simple thing. I just clicked on something, and it's taking, you know, like two minutes to do something. I said, I don't understand it. But uh, it must be this extra code that these programmers do, maybe some of them from India or whatever, or wherever they're, they're coming, Russia, a lot of Russian programmers. Um, so uh, your talk has been extremely informative, and uh, uh, although I have not been, uh, I only have one little... Uh, programming thing that I do on my job at this time, um, which and if they ever get rid of that language and I'm the only one in the company that knows it, I'll be in trouble, I guess, but uh, uh, it's one of those proprietary languages that uh, uh, is really simple, but uh, uh, unless you know what to do, it's like everything else, uh, um, you know, I can change this little thing and, oh, well, that worked, and uh, if I didn't do it right, well, I can experiment and then, you know, I'm done and, you know, maybe a few minutes or an afternoon, like you say, and I guess some people might fake it and say it takes two weeks to make this little change, but um, um, it's uh, very uh, uh, good to know that a lot of the things that I, I picked up about, yes, that people do make these incredible uh, wastages of time and uh, all these extra things the program does, like checking every factor, 
up to millions of factors unnecessarily that uh, that they're still still doing these things. So um, it would be uh, nice to know some of these things about um, um, these new operating systems and browsers. Uh, I, I do worry very much about. Um, the fact that nobody knows what this code is doing, um, and it, uh, it very much uh, discourages me that you, with your expertise, admit that you have no way of knowing what Microsoft is doing. Um, and I do worry about the new operating system that they're coming out with, um, and uh, the things they're building into the newer uh, PCs, uh, that they're, they're, they're going to be able to track us easier, and um, um, apparently uh, Google, um, Although they claim to do no evil, they have kept a database of what everyone's done with searches. So every search that you've done going back years might be in a Google database somewhere. So uh, these, these are things that might be uh, good for another talk at some time. So thank you very much. I don't, I don't know anything about programming, but uh, you are talk was a very informative for a layman, and I thank you. The country did not mention, probably I can mention, is India. And uh, one of the problem Indians have is that, and most of the countries, underdeveloped countries have, they don't have background or SKU knowledge of atmosphere and everything which we grow up with in America. And uh, sometimes they talk about why some, some cities are more favorable for talents and other cities are not. It's a similar kind of thing. The main thing I want to talk about is the perception and reality in international. So many times uh, about China, people have a lot of misconception in their economic system. Chinese economic system basically is a uh, model after ours. They, and uh, most, most other Western countries. The essential industries where country's future depends, government is heavily involved, just like United States. Our land grant university, our railway act, our highways, our nuclear support of nuclear energy, our, our support of so many other, many, our, no, our support of uh, our defense program in, in, in the same thing in China. Second thing, banking system. China basically has a similar banking system as ours. And uh, they have the same problem as we have. There are big industries and you know, big companies. It's easier for them to get loans. And the small guys cry. And they cannot get a loan. If they get a loan, they have to pay more and there will be lots of condition and collaterals. So, so see, corruption, same. City, same. Our, our city of Chicago sure. and state of Illinois sure. gives incentive to industries to bring their jobs here. China state fights, fights for the industry, and they give incentive or free land or whatever they can do. Same thing in India. So once, once country develops to a certain level, it's a more or less same as we, we are and IMF and other international institutions, they teach them how to do it. Lots of African countries, same way. So our perception and reality is quite different, and we need to understand that uh, how it works, if we are going to be competitive in the world. Second thing talk about India and Pakistan. The recent development, see how, how important is education in our foreign policy. If more Pakistani are educated, and as more of them meet in a diaspora situation in, in England and in the United States, and they find that uh, Indian and Pakistan are the same people, they think same, they, they, they speak the same language culturally, and uh, the, the, the propaganda which Pakistani government has created was not valid. And so there is a great movement in the Pakistan educated class to do more and more work with India, and India India and Pakistan as a partner, and, and that, that, that is a good <coughs> development. The, the, unfortunately, America, uh, in uh, encircling of Soviet Union during the uh, 50s and on, they, they tell the Pakistani military stronger than the political system, 
and uh, that created a situation which is more complicated and virtually destroyed Pakistan. And we are still a major corrupting influence. Okay. Uh, whatever it goes to military, no, not, not much goes to a development of irrigation system or crop development or all those things, very little goes. Third thing, okay, the perceptions of Israelis <coughs> and Jewish community of Arabs. And uh, there are lots of inter, inter, inter what you call it, uh, marriages between Arabs and uh, Jews there. And uh, the reality is that, that uh, the, all the thing talk about Arabs is not true. And uh, more and more people they meet in, in America and other places, they are finding out that they can do business with each other. See, but what is happening is that, that uh, in a Western Europe, there are some in a minority, substantial minorities in America and much more in a Western Europe, they are, they are turning against, not only against Israel, but against Jews. And, and we, we have a, some kind of a creation, creation of a, uh, anti-Semitism uh, in Europe, and, uh, which is an unfortunate byproduct of the policy of our not resolving the Palestine and Israeli issues. And, uh, and American Jews are mostly responsible for that because, because we are the big, big Antilada that is supporting the radical elements there. Lots of Israeli will like to have a, uh, have a partnership with Arab countries and, uh, and lots of Arab uh, Israeli witnesses are doing business in Egypt and Jordan. Thank you. Jeff Frommer. Yeah, well, uh, it was interesting stuff, sir, even for us novices. Back 30 years ago when I took a few courses in this stuff, they called them subroutines rather than modules. I don't know if that brings a bell with you, but anyway, uh, I was particularly struck by your broader comments about such phenomena as the mentality of management in modern times, <laughs> where you were talking about months being the near horizon. And it brought to mind hearing Louis Rukeyser, got me 30 some years ago, talking about how on Wall Street six months is long term. Well, <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, I don't think it's gotten any better since then in, that, in the broader society either. And indeed, it's probably gotten quite a bit worse. And it's probably going to continue to get worse as far as Doug's comment about Google. Big bro is going to know everything, uh, okay, is what it's going to come down to, all right, and uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, one way of looking at the trends from a broader standpoint is that this, what we can do now on the internet is, by the standards of human history, utterly phenomenal. One of the things we can do that really could end up mattering quite a bit in the fairly near future is to learn about available stuff. Stuff which did not exist at any affordable price not too long ago and probably will not exist in the fairly near future at virtually any price. I'm not talking about stuff like folding stretchers for a hundred bucks that you can, and who the hell knows whether they make them in China or whatever, wherever they make that kind of stuff for that kind of a price. Folding stretchers. I bought myself a bulletproof blanket. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is, this is just so incredible that they have this stuff and find where it's available. In the old days, a Rockefeller could you know, hire somebody to scour, scour, or hire, have an army of guys going around scouring stores uh, for stuff like that. Now you can just Google it and, and see if it exists. Uh, well, that party in all likelihood will 
come to an end in the not too distant future, largely because of peak oil and related matters. Not only peak oil per se, but inflation, especially insofar as it gets into the hyper stage, which is probably going to happen. And one consequence of something approaching hyperinflation is that firms, when they make deals with each other, suppliers, distributors, um, all the way through the chain, if they do, if, they, if, if, if the contract calls for X number of goods to be delivered at such and such a price, if there's no clause whereby that price can be adjusted for authentic actual inflation as opposed to the fake CPI that this government pukes out, you see. If there's no clause, well then what you could get was the kind of thing that I understand that you got in Germany in the 20s, whereby firms just reneged. Yeah, okay, you're gonna, you, were, you guys were going to pay us a thousand marks for this stuff. Well now a thousand marks won't buy you a, a crumb of bread, so forget about it. And as I understand it, there were all sorts of reneging going on for re those kind of reasons. The, 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 the folks who honored those kind of contracts were the exception rather than the rule. And of course, since inflation involves not merely the number of dollars or marks or whatever they are out there, but also a matter of the number of available goods, it's a ratio, prices are a ratio between, uh, among other things, the, you know, the dollars in this case, and goods. Well, if you've got fewer goods because contracts, because the whole supply chain has become a mess, because firms are reneging, then your ratio, the ratio is going to deteriorate even further against the consumers. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways that, that this stuff can deteriorate. So, you know, uh, what we are living in now is, in a sense, the good old days compared to what we're probably going to end up with. So, I don't know, I probably said enough. There is one question that I failed to ask you tonight. And why is it that some people still have their VCRs flashing 12? They're 81 years old. <laughs> the thing is, is that what surprises me is that, you know, in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s, products were built to last. People that were easy to figure out and to use. And today, even in just my short lifetime of 51 years, I should say, 50 years, I have found just this increasing level of complexity. In, in the usage of everyday overall things. I mean, you know, I could go back even less than 10 years. I had one stinking computer with about maybe four gigabytes of, of total space. Now that I'm in the video, of course, I've got two systems, the possible third integrated with external storage. I've got over, at present count, nine and a half terabytes worth of data. And, and storage is getting much cheaper. And yet at the same time, I have a mother who's in her 70s who still has trouble with getting email. I've often wondered, do we really need to get this complex or could our complexity get things simpler? I, I, I really begin to wonder whether, you know, we're just out innovating ourselves or if the propositions you're applied to programming apply to a lot more of our consumer electronics. You know, they're designed by engineers who know the screen systems, but when it comes to the available consumer, they'll have stuff in there they'll never even use, let alone know what's there. You know, a lot of times, for example, I, I, when I bought my first cell phone, I just wanted to make and receive phone calls, not texts. I didn't need to browse the web or navigate. And I still, just like making a phone call on a cell phone. I'd much rather not have a cell phone, to be honest, because I don't like to be that reachable. But at the same time, 
you know, I do see a, a, a pattern in our economy where a lot of this complexity actually does bring a lot of benefits because one of the things that I do like is the multiplicity of programming that I have available on the web. Sure, I have to go get some work and find it, like YouTube, Google Video, lots of documentary channels, all kinds of stuff that you're able to find things with. But I just can't understand why sometimes things have to be so complex before they get so simple again. You know, and like I've been saying to myself for a long time, I knew how computers worked back in 84, 85. I could figure out a DOS prompt. And yet it was less than about a six or seven year period when I opened up another computer. What's this, Windows 3.1? It really wasn't until I actually took a nine week course in, in computer pro, you know, just in basic computer networking that finally reached me to a level of understanding where how all of this integrated and worked. And now I'm even now finding that same knowledge on a rusty scale. And, and sometimes the rate of innovation and the rate of change, you know, creates jobs, but sometimes you just wonder, why is it that we get so complex? Why is it that, that things have to get complex before they get simple? And our, our rate of, granted, I love the rate of change in our economy and the jobs that it produces, but whatever happened to good old quality? As you're saying, whatever happened to good old, you buy something once, it lasts for a few years? It doesn't need all these stinking features. I don't know. Okay, well, thanks, Conrad, for an uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I'm, uh, I guess, a former programmer, although maybe once a programmer, always a programmer. I don't know. Uh, I work at a law firm now as a paralegal, but I still. I wrote a uh, access database uh, uh, to help me, you know, you know our, we keep our clients in there and uh, other, you know, service providers for, for personal injury firms, so we have to get uh, bills and records uh, requested from hospitals and clinics all over the place, so keep those in there. And I've got quite a bit of my stuff automated, and, uh, you know, it's, real, it's, it's, well, it's wonderful. I mean, I, it's just... <laughs> I've done it. I mean, when I first started there, the system didn't exist, and uh, all the uh, you know legal documents were prepared, you know, from scratch, just basically about each time. And then invariably there was mistakes in there, because you you know usually we use a template of some previous case or something for a document, and then there's always something you forgot to type in or. From one document to another, you would uh, make a mistake or something. And it's so much nicer now that I have everything automated. I need to print a couple of uh, liens or something like that. I just, you know, type in the uh, the client account number or you know, and a uh, and then I pick uh, from a list of reports what uh, what type of lien I want and you know it spits it all out and it's all perfect. I know that the year is going to be right on the thing. I'm not going to forget in January. You know how you know how in January everybody every year you know when you write your own checks out you always put you know last year on and stuff like that. Well, you know that that same thing happens if you're typing good. The computer, that's all taken care of now, and it's all, it's all, you know, perfect. And matter of fact, just did, uh, some weeks ago, uh, an insurance company or something called my boss and I was talking to him on the phone. They said, well, I, I think you, I think there's a mistake on your lien, and uh, and my boss says, I don't think so. You better look closer again, because you know, we've got this. When we've done so many of them, we've, you know, we made sure the quality was was top notch, you know, and uh, sure enough, we did not have a mistake. They. They had a mistake, or they read something, or interpreted something wrong. But anyway, uh, so I still like uh, working uh, with computers and programming. And more or less, relaxing to me. I find it very it's fun. lethargic. Yeah, uh, you know what? You know what? Well, actually, and I worked in several capacities. And when I first started programming, I was doing it for fun on my own at home. And then I went back to school for it. I'd already graduated. When I went to college, though, uh, the first time. Uh, you know, the programming was done with punch cards, okay? And, uh, and I thought, well, this is entirely too tedious and clerical for me. So I didn't want anything to do with it at all. And it wasn't until PCs came out, and I bought a little, I bought a Commodore 64 to start playing with it at home, and I thought, wow, this is a, this is a ball. And then, uh, at that time, then I was working in the industrial engineering field, and uh, I went to a conference or a uh, seminar on spreadsheets, and... Uh, 
I saw an electronic spreadsheet that uh, being uh, uh, displayed or demonstrated, and I thought, wow, I, I, I've got to get, I got to get into this. You know, this is, this will make my job so much easier. I, I used to do, uh, you know, these spreadsheets with pencils and, and, uh, you know, calculators, and doing these uh, linear regression analysis and things, squaring numbers and looking, you know, all that stuff, and. Uh, so I went back to school really to help me in my job as an industrial engineer. Okay, well, you know, computers are coming to the to the workplace. I better get computer knowledgeable. So, so I went back to school to, to learn computers just to help my industrial engineering work. And as it turns out, while I was in school, a job came in at the job placement office. Of some some place was looking. I don't even want to tell you who it was. I'm embarrassed to say who it was. But some place wanted a, wanted to hire a programmer to write a custom program. I needed a job, so I went and applied, and I, I got the job. It was a contract, like a consulting job. And after I did that one, I never went back to industrial engineering after that. I kept getting job after job after job, and I just started programming that. And I was on my own for, for quite a while, and eventually I ended up you know, working for some companies. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, I was doing mainframe programming at U.S. Steel, the Y2K thing. And I'll tell you, mainframe program, I thought the main, mainframe environment was just awful, horrendous. I, just, I really hated every, basically every minute of it. I just really could not stand mainframe. It's such a different atmosphere from PCs. But anyway, back to other topics tonight uh, that we talked about. Uh, technology in general, and, and, and I, what I like about programming and computers and technology, you know, this, this world is flat thing that Friedman talks about. You can have your programmers in India or China or whatever. I'm not worried about any of that. Because I figure the mark, the free market, will work. Oh, you know? and it takes like almost zero energy to transfer programs and data around the world. I figure, why not start? Look at me. I would start. I would like take the Illinois Department. I would take like the uh, the Illinois Motor Vehicle Department and you know have it done in India. Have all that computer stuff done in India for about. A hundredth of the price, and, and as bad as their quality may be over there, it's probably got to be 20 times better than over here. There's your 20 to 1 ratio right there, so I'd rather have like you know, some of those guys than these, these people we have over here in their public employee pensions that are breaking us. So we have no more chance. They're not going to hire you. Let's thank you. Thank you, Conrad, for an interesting presentation and PowerPoint there. Uh, I'll just be eclectic as usual here. Uh, every occupation, uh, this is a new field, uh, relatively new in the world of work. Uh, computer technology, if you wish. Uh, every occupation. Uh, develops, I, I represent ma many over the years, from custodians to even, even on occasion, Route 10 bus drivers. Um, and you have to get familiar with an occupation that I was thinking of here. Uh, every occupation develops terms of art, a culture, a mythology here, and I think you covered that unknowingly, at least from my perspective there. Um, I even call it a Form 1212 because you get people in the same field together and they, they pass around terminology and so forth and they place special emphasis upon certain things. Uh, how can I explain it? In arbitration, it's the first day we often have to explain what is going on and what the people actually do or what work they perform. Uh, to the arbiter so that they can understand what's going on here. Um, and that's what I was looking at here. You guys have developed your own culture. And tragically, there's some aspects of it I don't like whatsoever. I noticed in your PowerPoint you were feeding some sort of stereotypical mistakes to management. I guess because you're a consultant, you're, you're presuming that management was making mistakes and you wanted some corrective action. I guess that's what consultants get paid for by managers. Um, and I was questionable about some of that myself. Whether or not languages are too long or too short, uh, who cares if the cat is black or white as long as it catches the mouse? 
Uh, I don't think you made a substantial case to my mind. If it's a utilitarian unknown thing, if there's some time constraints or something of that nature, if there's only a malfunction uh, in it, then it, it rises to the threshold. These are ephemeral aspects. I don't know if you, we use the term, okay, term of art in librarianship called ephemeral, minim, uh, de minimis. Are these, are these substantive? If not, then I don't really care about it. It has no influence or no effect. Is there some purity language that must be achieved? If so. Now the other one, I've got the question, sir. You're just 21 and we're being facetious here. I assure you one thing about the field of programming is that you do not violate the laws of nature. It's called the bell-shaped curve. And I'm really amazed that we found the field of human endeavor that goes apart from the bell-shaped curve in terms of the performers, the people who perform this activity. And you, and you actually maintain that you have an association that has data to substantiate this, which is very even further amazing to me. But <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> you have data, I know you do. <laughs> But uh, in every field of endeavor, you're going to have achievers and underachievers. It's called performance appraisal, assessment of performance. And I don't think your field has any unique features. Um, yeah, I do think that, I'm sorry, whatever these programs are, I do think the programs put out by professionals here with a decent living wage in the United States, but now better programs than those put out by, by children <laughs> in sweatshops. <laughs> so yes, the conditions are a factor that it very much influence the end product. And it get on it here. I, it certainly does. There's some criteria. Are there ethics? Are there concerns? Is there liability to the product? things of that nature. If there are in fact subjective aspects to the end product of what he was talking about, those are crucial. If these are people removed from, uh, from that process whatsoever, even if they, if they are concerned, even a company that stands by its name or its product is going to give some degree of assurance, apart from guarantees and what have you, that the people who purchase that product, that it is going to operate and function. And you're not going to get that by this free market does not is not that free, and you get what you pay for in this world here. And these are other factors that yeah, in fact, there's subjective things. If I purchase software from a particular concern, or if this concern is marketing software, yes, their professional reputation is going to have to stand by it. And yeah, and I think they're going to want to spend a few bucks to see that it be done by qualified people. Uh, whether or not there, you seem, seem, seem to think that you can't measure people who do this, I find it absolutely spurious and nonsensical. Thank you very much. So that was good. There at least used to be a capitalist saying that the customer is always right. And when I heard this topic, first came across this topic, I thought, what in the world is going on here? You got all these customers of computer technology, and how come the competitive mechanism isn't working? Well, I think I kind of got a solution. And I'll, I should have anticipated this, I suppose, but. I think the ultimate, the underlying problem is that government is, to, is a large percentage of the customers. And the governments really care if they get their money's worth or not. You would see that uh, they, they don't in any kind of other things. Now, I'm a lot more familiar with transit technology, tra transportation technology. And do, does that, do they care what, what they're really getting for their money? I mean, you can look at all these federally financed uh, transit projects that, uh, and how they run up a bill and everything on. Uh, 
And uh, what we see just lately is uh, this uh, bus rapid transit, which they say costs only a fraction of a rapid transit line. And uh, I kind of have to wonder about that too, because is there really a competitive? The, the, uh, I think the real underlying reason for this bus rapid transit is that the federal government is running out of money. They have to look for something more economical, except they haven't really completed that. Uh, that's not. And true. Well, it's very true. I'll give you a, 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 a nice long talk about it. <laughs> but when they when they when they have a the, the transit industry runs basically on a cost plus basis, like the military industrial complex. Oh, that's just plenty true. Soon, and 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 that the competitive mechanism still isn't there in terms of technology because there's one that can do a lot more for a lot less and even be financed locally than uh, this bus rapid transit. And uh, so you're, you're violating uh, one fool at a time before I forget. But anyway, uh, I think we have to get back, you know, the free market, you, you, I, yeah, I don't think you any credit though, you know, the free market isn't free. And if the government is going to be the major con consumer, the major customer, well, it's definitely not going to be free. And I, I think it's going to kind of subvert the whole market. We have an open mic, and I'm sure we got a few There's people who need to say a few more things. You want to close out? No, oh, wait a minute, let me tell you. Okay. I'll give you some, yeah, it will be. BRT. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit less than the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a thing marketed by a private company, the free market. It has nothing to do with the federal government. Free market transit people came up with, actually there's three different kinds of BRT. Just like anything, like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. <laughs> no, there is. There's cheap. There's very, there's very inexpensive ones. You just you put features on stoplights that kind of help those buses move along quicker. Very economical. A middle range where you dedicate lane, and a third where very they're, they're almost like street cars, uh, which involves a bit more re reconfiguration of of the streets. They also incorporate permanent bicycle lanes. There's even ones where you move the parking of cars like five feet from the curb and that's the lane for buses. They're not operating, I don't know, what it, that's what I mean. Jumping on the federal government, it was developed by private transportation companies and they're marketing it. I call it, and if you want, it's the flavor of the month. It's a cheap trolley, it's a cheap L uh, street car. Alternative, it's nonsensical, it's not even like a trolley bus, it doesn't have the economical features, and it's not an L train, which it's intended is to be a cheap version. And it has nothing to do with federal, state, or local government. It's free market guys who are selling a piece of junk to the transportation right. community. Who's buying it? States. Who's buying it? Nobody. Los Angeles. <laughs> Uh, uh. Mexico City. Well, as long as there's second reps here. So yeah, blame speaking. the government. It was developed by the stupid ass yeah, there are second reps. As long it doesn't care about the Yeah. As long as there's second reps here, so to speak. I had a few comments about the free market. In order for the free market to work as the Adam Smiths of the world. Yeah. <laughs> expected it to work, I'm pretty sure he stipulated at least two conditions. One, I was, he was implicit, explicit about one, I don't remember about the other. But what he was explicit about was that you had to have in place rules of the game. 
And those rules had to be reasonably consistently enforced. So that when you went to the store and bought a box that said on the box chocolates, they were chocolates, not Here. dried dog turds. Don't change, me. Don't need change. Oh, now, thanks, it's sir. not gotten that bad yet. But it's getting there in certain respects, in certain industries in particular. Now, there are, however, two aspects to how to the old, with the way the mechanism used to work fairly well anyway, whereby you could depend on getting the chocolates, not the dried dog turds. Number one, there was the government where the politicians would write the laws, and then the cops, way more often than not, would reasonably consistently enforce the laws. That, in particular, in certain industries, such as banking, um, has deteriorated drastically in the past 30 years, give or take. And for starters, I recommend you see the movie Inside Job, which gets into a certain amount of how that came to pass. And also there's another one more recently named Bailout, with some Chicagoans, named, uh, one of the actors named John Titus. But aside from, and, 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 and related to, the phenomenon of the cops sleeping no doubt with the, uh, the considerable implicit encouragement of politicians and their campaign contributors. The other related phenomenon is that it's also the job of the media to point out to the people those situations where chocolates are, the, what, what, the, 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 where dog turds are being misrepresented as chocolates, and where the cops are sleeping on the job with respect to prosecuting those who try to sell you dog turds as chocolates. And there was a time to it, at least a degree, and it came to a head in, as it were in the 70s, when there was aggressive journalism even about whose pockets were being greased so as to get the cops to sleep. And so when you have the media, instead in recent times, going hog wild about the death of Nicole Brown Simpson, or Chandra Levy, or Michael Jackson, and not putting much effort to, into investigating whose pounds are getting greased, how, for what purposes, and even though it might lead to the fact that the cops are sleeping, well, what are you going to get? You're going to get, the, I mean, the politicians and the guys on Wall Street and all these other places, they can see what's happening to the mechanism's accountability. And they can see the American people might as well be walking around with wads of $100 bills sticking out of their pockets. And these guys, they'll just, you know, as, as passerby, passerby, passerby comes along, just will reach for every pocket as it, as it passes along. There's no, it, 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 in boxing, they call it taking a dive, all right? Where, 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 you know, one player, one of the boxers, when he gets hit in the jar or whatever, he's not actually knocked out, but he falls down. He got paid off to fall down, and the ref counts up to 10, and the other guy's, his, his hand is raised as the winner of the fight. Well, all right, five minutes. Hopefully, you get the idea. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so many stimulating is. topics came up that I had to come up and talk again. I do have to give you a software uh, quality uh, anecdote. Personally, it happened to me. Uh, so I was for a long time I was a freelance consultant, uh, you know, basically a database programmer. What I found most most business software application software it's database related. I mean, I've never had anybody ask me to write a program to generate prime numbers or to calculate curve convert to Fahrenheit to Celsius or anything like that. Mm. Most people want to do database stuff. Well, I did a database program for a heating, ventilating, and air conditioning company. Uh, dispatch tracking the system. Track their customers and all the history of all the work on their heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. So when the guys on the trucks were dispatched, they knew that 
they're going here, they knew what model the air conditioner was going to have, what, la what the last uh, repair was, and things like that. And they would send out the appropriate truck that had the right parts for that piece of equipment on there. So, and there'd also be notes on there like, knock loudly, client uh, has a part that's hard of hearing. Uh, one, one of them once said, that, you know, do not smoke, you know, in front of the, things like that. Well, anyway, so I wrote this uh, system. Actually, I did a conversion. They used to have a Unix system, and I converted them from Unix to a network PC system. And I was doing this in cahoots with a, with a computer store when there, in the days when there used to be independent computer stores around. And so the independent computer store used to frequently hire me to write the software. They would supply the networking, you know, they would supply the hardware and network computers. They would hire me to write the software. So I wrote the software for this company and I'd come in periodically and upgrade it and maintain it and things like that. They always wanted some new feature or something. But they were really slow about paying their bill. And they used to pay the computer store, and then the computer store would pay me. So one day, uh, I, made a ch I had to go in there and make a change. I decided to put a little Trojan horse in there that said, you know, if, you're, if your computer bill, the bill's not paid, you know, it says, you know, enter this password. Uh, you know, I had a, uh, it had a certain date where it would require you a password. And it would say, you know, you have not paid your bill, you know, enter the password to continue. Pay your bill to obtain password to continue. Well, about, I don't know, 60 or 90 days later, I totally have forgotten about it. I get a call from the computer store. And they go, hey, Bob, this, uh, you know, company, blank, blank, heating and cooling, called. And, you know, this thing popped up, and they are furious. And uh, they said they, they demand that password right now. The, the next call is going to be from their lawyer. So I coughed up the password. You know, and they said, oh, you know, you know you're, you'll get paid, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, they said, by the way, give us that password, you know, he'll get paid. But we never want to see him step foot on this property again. You know? So I was persona not grad of there. So, but I did, I did get my money, you know, and I gave him the password. Well, uh, about, I don't know, a year or two later, I get a call out of the blue from this computer store. They go, Bob, uh, blank, blank, heating, ventilating, air conditioning, wants you to go over there and do some changes to the program. I said, well, I, well, I thought they didn't, never wanted to see me again. And they said, well, you know what? They, they hired a couple other guys, and they said, you know what? Your quality was just so good. Oh. You did such a great job. They oh. want you back, oh. and they said, they don't pay their bill. This, this so from, from that point on, oh, from that point on, I went back, and I you know, every time I should work, and I was like paid them, like so immediately. They would, they would pay. Oh. Oh. Honestly, God, oh. I, was, I believe in God, I was swear to God. Oh. True story. Oh. Oh. And so I, I did a little research of that. The only ones that wanted I did a little Please. research. Please come back. Yeah, they wanted me back because you know the quality was good. I had another quality story too. I used to write some shareware, and I, I had I had you know customers tell me that they bought my package was because of the of the, of the quality. And I, I would let them you know have a sample period, and then they would try it out, and they liked the quality, so they bought my product. Oh. But uh, the what the uh, the legal aspects here of doing things like putting a Trojan horse in, even for something like getting paid, there's different kinds of tro Trojan horses and stuff and malicious type of software. There are pro there are you know bugs that do bad things, you know, or not or you know intentional things, Trojan horses that do bad things, damage. Mine didn't do any of that. Mine just simply prohibited the running of the program. And I figured if you don't if you don't pay your light bill, they turn your lights off, right? If you don't pay your water bill, they turn your water off. So okay. I figure if you don't pay your soft bill, software bill, I'm turning off the software, right? But uh, in the eyes of the law, well, here's the first thing. Number one, in front of a jury, a jury is going to equate something like that with a malicious software, just like software that destroys things. And yeah, and the other thing is that uh, you know there is there is a there is a remedy for not getting your bill paid, and the remedy is to go to like small claims court or something. You cannot put somebody out of business uh, for it. So uh, if you're thinking about putting Trojan horse in software, don't don't do it. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 please come back. Please, please. Well, the point that's directly related to the topic tonight. Oh my God. This business about doctors and chocolate. Again, you know, it's not just a matter of government enforcing that. How about the customers? I mean, does the customers know the difference? If they don't, well, they kind of deserve what they get. 
As far as bus rapid transit being private, well, uh, you can look at all these tanks and uh, airplanes and everything else that the military and industrial complex buys, and those are all private products too. I mean, the, the industrial and the military industrial complex is private. They're government contractors. And, but they, you know, we, we do get back to our topic. And that those things often don't have the quality they're supposed to have either. Bob, please come back, Bob. Bob, please give us a minute. Get up there and give the last one. You got a few things to say. You got uh, 15 minutes to go ahead and give us the last word. That's your last, Bob. And I'm sure you got uh, well, a lot of content. I, I just had uh, one uh, reply to something Charlie raised. Uh, the bell curve does, in fact, continue to apply. But when we talk about this normal distribution, the bell curve, we're not talking about the degree of productivity, we're talking about the number of people who have a, a given level of productivity. And the, I think the bell curve probably does apply to those, and we find comparatively few people out there at that plus 20 range, and, and comparatively few maybe at those. I'm one of those guys. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, it's the same in any creative activity. I mean, if you, if you were... Uh, if you were rating uh, composers on the bell curve, I mean, Beethoven wouldn't wouldn't be in the middle, you know. Yeah, why is that the world? You're not part of the world. <laughs> Where are you? What planet are you from? Senior. Oh, senior. Well, oh, he's dying. Well, that was that was the only point I. Oh, all right. Well, oh, wrap up See, then. That is his wrap up. Well, uh, we also talk why why yes. our, why are our customers so tolerant? Uh, we have because there's so many of them. We have individually we have very little bargaining power. That's right. uh, when I worked for uh, Union Carbide Corporation, uh, we if we called up IBM, they listened. Uh, when I call up Microsoft, you know I, I leave a recorded message. <laughs> I don't have, we don't have that kind of a bargaining power with the vendors. Okay. Yeah. So thank you all. I appreciate all right, it. Good. I know it's a topic that, uh, that isn't of uh, direct interest to everyone, but uh, uh, if, if we think of a follow-up, we might uh, propose it. Very well presented. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to our speaker. Thank you all for coming. I hope to see you next week or 